Hello and welcome. My name is Tom from Tank and AFV News, and you are watching the first episode in a series we are doing called The Tanks of World War II. Now, our plan for the series is that each episode will look at a different tank that served uh, during the Second World War. And we're going to start with the German invasion of Poland in 1939, and we're going to work our way chronologically through the various different campaigns until we get all the way to the end of the war in 1945. Now, this first episode is going to look at the Polish TK-3 and TKS tankettes, and it kicks off um, this first series, which is going to be looking at the German invasion of Poland in September of 1939. Now, we're going to be doing four episodes in that series. Uh, we're going to be looking at, of course, starting with this episode, looking at the TK tankat series. Then we're going to also do the Polish 7TP tank, the German Panzer I, and the German Panzer II. Now, for those of you who are saying, what about the German Panzer III and IV, or the Panzers 35 and 38? We're going to be saving those for the next series, which will be covering the 1940 invasion of France, since really they played a bigger role in that campaign than they did in Poland in 1939. Now, the same goes for um, the French-built uh, R-35 and FT-17 tanks that were operated by the Poles in 1939. Um, those vehicles will also get their own uh, videos, but that'll be part of the 1940 uh, uh, Invasion of France series. And of course, we are aware that uh, it wasn't just Germany that invaded Poland in September of 39, but the Soviet Union as well, which uh, came in a little, about two weeks after the Germans did. Uh, that said, we're going to save the Soviet tanks for an even later series, which will be our 1941 Operation Barbarossa series down the road. One of the reasons I picked the TK series as the first vehicle to look at is because, frankly, there's less to talk about uh, regarding this vehicle from a technical standpoint um, than some of the other vehicles on our list. And that gives us a little more time to discuss the historical background of the Polish 1939 campaign and the state of the Polish army at that time. Now, prior to World War I, the independent nation of Poland did not exist. Um, its former territory and peoples had been carved up between the German, Russian, and Austro-Hungarian empires. Now, by the end of World War I, all three of those empires were no more. And the Western allies of France and Great Britain supported the reconstitution of the Polish state. Now, however, the borders of such a state were not clearly defined. And hostility um, from their neighbors led to a series of military clashes soon after the new Polish state was declared. Now, most notable of these was the Polish-Bolshevik War, um, which lasted from 1919 to 1921, in which the new Polish state was able to defeat the Soviet Red Army. And while the victory secured Poland's borders for the time being, uh, the Polish state spent the next two decades being surrounded by powerful hostile neighbors, such as Germany and the USSR. And due to the border wars of the early 20s, poor relationships with their smaller neighbors, such as Lithuania or Czechoslovakia, so they weren't really able to work out any sort of mutual defense agreements with those countries. So therefore, the Polish military found themselves in the rather difficult strategic situation of having their enemies quite close, while their allies, Britain and France, were further away. The other major issue facing Poland by the 1930s was their lack of economic and industrial development compared to their two hostile neighbors, Germany and the, uh, the, and the Soviet Union. By this point, the Soviets had rapidly industrialized through Stalin's five-year plans, and Hitler declared uh, the end of the Versailles Treaty and launched the expansion of the German Wehrmacht. Now, Poland, with their much smaller industrial base, was quickly losing ground in the production of modern armaments, and by the time of the German invasion in 1939, they were far behind their aggressive neighbors in terms of quantity and, in some regards, quality of modern arms. So, for example, in 1935, Germany outspent Poland in defense spending by a factor of 21 to 1, and by 1939, that figure had jumped up to a rather astounding 53 to 1 ratio. In regards to tanks, the situation was not much better. Oddly enough, prior to 1933, Poland actually had more tanks than either Germany or the Soviet Union. However, throughout the rest of the 1930s, this edge was quickly lost. When war broke out in 1939, the Poles had around 880 tanks, while the German Wehrmacht had 2,750 tanks committed to the invasion of Poland. To make matters worse, when the Soviet Union invaded two weeks later, they brought an additional 4,700 tanks. And while those numbers don't add up very well for the Poles, 
of even bigger concern is the type of tanks that the Poles had and how they were organized and deployed. The most common tank in Polar service in 1939 was technically not even really a proper tank, but something called a tankette. Now these were the TK3 and its successor, the TKS. Around 300 of each model were built. Um, TK3 production taking place from 1931 to 33, and TKS production from 34 to 36. Now in order to understand what these vehicles were, we need to go back a little further in time and over to the United Kingdom. Now it's probably fair to say that in the 1920s, the UK was the leading designer and producer of tanks and they had become an exporter of armored vehicles in this period to countries without the means or expertise to design the tanks themselves. Now, one of the most popular of the British export uh, ideas was the Tankette, a small two-man tracked vehicle armed with a machine gun and just enough armor to resist small arms fire. The origin of the Tankette can be traced back to the mid-1920s when British military engineer Major Gifford Lequenz Martel decided to build a one-man tank in his garage. Now, by 1926, the War Department had ordered pilot models of a one-man and a two-man Tankette, and the idea started to catch on with other British arms uh, makers. Carden Lloyd Tractors Limited, a firm founded by Sir John Carden and Vivian Lloyd, um, and later purchased by Vickers Armstrongs, introduced a tankette model that would become the most successful of the type and would be purchased uh, by the British Army um, and tested in a number of different models. And development eventually would culminate in the Carden Lloyd Mark VI tankette. Now, this was a small two-man vehicle, which was considered by the British Army as a reconnaissance vehicle and a mobile machine gun. And in that role, it laid down the groundwork for the later series of small tracked vehicles um, that the British would adopt, such as the Bren carrier and the Universal carrier. Now, for foreign customers, though, the Mark VI Tankette was an attractive option due to its low cost and simplicity comp compared to that of a proper tank. And thus, it was sold to a number of countries, including Italy, the Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, Bolivia, Japan, and of course, Poland, who purchased 11 vehicles in 1929 for testing and evaluation. These British Tankettes would become the basis of the Polish TK series. After testing the initial batch of tankettes they received from Great Britain, they quickly realized the original suspension on these vehicles was inadequate, and they improved it by adding some leaf springs to the road wheel bogies and return rollers. After production of two Mark VI tankettes of their own, the Poles decided to redesign the vehicle completely. This resulted in two different prototypes created by the State Engineering Works in 1930, the TK-1 and the TK-2. Now the primary difference between the two prototypes was that the TK-1 had a rear-mounted drive sprocket and used the engine from the Ford Model A, while the TK-2 had a front-mounted drive sprocket like the Mark VI did, and it used the less powerful Ford Model T engine. After a series of tests with the Mark VI, TK-1, and TK-2, a new version of the vehicle was produced which incorporated improvements to the steering, cooling, and suspension systems as well as a fully enclosed fighting compartment. Now this vehicle would enter service as the TK-3. Now this vehicle would feature the front-mounted drive sprocket layout of the TK-2 while using the more powerful Ford Model A engine producing um, a whopping 40 horsepower. Now that may not seem like much, but these vehicles weighed less than three tons, so 40 horsepower would move them along at a reasonable clip. Now the vehicle had a crew of two. The driver sat on the left side of the vehicle while the gunner commander sat on the right side and operated the only armament of the vehicle, a CKM WZ-25 7.92 machine gun. Now, this gun is essentially a French Hotchkiss uh, M1914 machine gun, um, the World War, era, World War I era gun, rechambered for 7.92 Mauser ammunition, which was uh, the standard ammunition that the Polish Army used. Now this gun had originally been purchased for infantry use, but it was found to suffer from overheating and poor accuracy and is relegated to use in lower priority units and replaced in frontline use by the CKM WZ-30, which was a Polish uh, clone or variant of the Browning M1917 30 caliber heavy machine gun. However, the Hotchkiss was deemed good enough for use in armored cars and it also ended up in the TK series of tankettes. Now between the two crewmen sat the engine, the fuel tank was behind the gunner and the radiator behind the driver. Armor protection ranged from 8 millimeters at most 
um, which was on the front of the vehicle, um, and then its thinnest was three millimeters, which was on the roof. Um, and that provided protection against small arms fire and mortar and grenade fragments, but not much else. Now, any type of armor piercing around of the period was capable of penetrating these poorly armored vehicles. Total weight was less than three tons, making these vehicles some of the lightest armored fighting vehicles to be used during the war. Now, in 1933, there was a pr program undertaken to improve the TK-3. This improved version would become known as the TKS. Now, it featured improved armor. Um, the maximum thickness was now a whopping 10 millimeters, which really didn't make that much of a difference. The armor layout was also improved, sloping it where possible on the upper hull, which resulted in a slightly more streamlined look to the vehicle. Some of the later production TK3 tanks had also been equipped with a locally built Polsky Fiat engine instead of the Ford model that offered a slight improvement of, I think, two additional horsepower. Now, this engine was made standard in the TKS. And then in later production vehicles, they got an even slightly increased uh, cylinder diameter version of the engine, which resulted in a whopping output of 45 horsepower, although sources say that those engines tended to have um, troubles which were never quite resolved. Now, the suspension was also improved, and a new wider track was introduced on the TKS as well. Initially, the TKS was to receive the uh, Browning machine gun, or at least the Polish uh, version of it, uh, but these were deemed to be uh, of higher priority for the infantry, and the TKS had to make do with the same Hotchkiss machine gun that the TK-3 had. Uh, however, the TKS did feature an improved ball-style mount for the machine gun, as well as a telescopic sight. Now, the other important upgrade to the TKS was the introduction of better vision devices for the crew. Um, visibility in the TK-3 when the crew was buttoned up was quite poor. Now, these improvements also included a periscope on the roof for the gunner commander, which uh, was a significant improvement. Now, there are a number of variants worth noting, several of which were attempts to increase the firepower of these little vehicles. The TKD was an attempt in 1932 to mount a 47 millimeter infantry gun um, in an open compartment on top of a TK-3. Now, four of these were built and tested and found unsatisfactory due to the poor armor penetration of the gun. Now, a more successful attempt was the TKSD in 1937, which mated uh, the effective Bofors 37 millimeter WZ-36 cannon, which was the standard anti-tank gun adopted by the Polish army at that point, onto a TKS hull in a improved sort of lower profile open compartment, at least compared to the earlier uh, TKD. Now, only two of these uh, TKSDs were built, um, although they did see service during the war. Now, the most important of the upgun variants was the TKS equipped with the MKN WZ-38 FK 20 millimeter cannon in 1937. Now, this upgrade was found to involve relatively simple modifications to the TKS, and it was planned that this upgrade would be relatively widespread. However, only 24 vehicles were upgraded with the 20 millimeter cannon by the time the war started. Uh, however, as we shall see in the combat history section of the video, these 20 millimeter arm tank gats proved markedly more effective than the machine gun arm version. Unlike their German adversary, who deployed division-sized armored units, aka the famous Panzer divisions, the Polish army deployed their tanks much more conservatively, uh, parceling them out in small units, attaching them to their larger cavalry or infantry units um, to provide armored support. Now, these were typically company-sized units of tanks. Um, the tank at companies tended to be around 13 vehicles per company, and they were attached to infantry divisions, cavalry brigades, mechanized brigades, uh, of which there was only one in service and one in formation in 1939, or also to armored train units. Now, this dispersal of their tank str strength and small units scattered throughout the army was in part due to the influence of French military thinking on Polish doctrine. Another factor that prevented the deployment of larger armored units in the Polish army was the prestige and influence of the Polish cavalry branch. Now, Polish cavalry, cavalry have a long tradition of being the preferred branch of service of the Polish aristocracy and upper classes, and they had played an instrumental role in the Polish victory in the Polish-Bolshevik War, in particular, the spectacular victory in 1920 at the Battle of Kamarau, generally considered the last great battle between opposing cavalry forces. 
Now, while many inside the Polish army did in fact favor the mechanization of the cavalry, the traditionalists were able to preserve the horse in its traditional role, arguing that it was better suited for the muddy and rough terrain along the Soviet border than the tankettes and armored cars of the period, and of course also being able to point out their success in the 1920 conflict. The combat history of the TK series of tankettes is, with a few notable exceptions, not very impressive. While these vehicles were successful in certain roles, their limited firepower and very light armor meant that they were extremely vulnerable to enemy armor and anti-tank weapons, including marginal weapons such as anti-tank rifles. And of course, against the standard German 37mm anti-tank gun, they really didn't have much of a chance. Another factor that limited the combat effectiveness of these vehicles was the fact that uh, they were several years old, and particularly the earlier TK-3 series um, had, by 1939, uh, quite a bit of wear and tear on them, and also due to lack of spare parts, had suffered a mechanical breakdown. So a fair number, number of them never even make it to the battlefield um, due to mechanical breakdown. Uh, lack of radios in these vehicles also limited their combat effectiveness because it meant that they were able to operate in nothing larger than a company size unit. Um, and of course then the small size of these vehicles limited their ability to traverse particularly difficult ter terrain, which was another limitation. That said, there is one shining example of a TKS that got the better of its German opponents. And that story belongs to cadet Roman Edmund Orlick, um, who commanded a 20 millimeter armed TKS. Now, he would finish the 1939 campaign uh, credited with the destruction of 13 German tanks, including seven destroyed in one day in the fighting near Syracow. Now, one is forced to wonder how effective the TKS would have been overall if Moore had received the 20 millimeter upgrade, you know, based on the exploits of Cadet Orlick. So now we come to the part of the video where we give our evaluation of the TK series. Now, like other tank ads used in World War II, the Polish TK series was neither very successful, nor was it particularly important in the big picture. Its presence did little to stem the German advances in 1939, and it quickly disappeared after the fall of Poland, occasionally popping up in German service as a tractor, uh, internal security vehicle, uh, and there's even reports of them being used as snow plows on some Luftwaffe airfields. In terms of design, it was a technological dead end, as was the entire tank at concept. The limitations in performance and off-road ability of the TK series gave the tradition-bound Polish horse cavalry an excuse to justify their refusal to mechanize. Um, although in fairness, it's probably safe to say that even if that mechanization had gone forward, Polish industry wouldn't have been able to support it. On the plus side, it served as a relatively easy starting point for Polish industry to start developing their tank building capability. Unfortunately, Polish industrial capacity was never going to be able to keep up with either their German neighbor to the west or their Soviet neighbor to the east once those two countries committed to building up their own tank forces. Now, had the TK series served as a stepping stone to the creation of an effective Polish armored force, we would probably rate it much higher. However, it did not, and thus, we have to consider it essentially a failure. Well, and that wraps up our look at the Polish TK-3 and TKS tankettes. Uh, join us next episode when we look at another vehicle that also traced its roots to the tankette fad of the early 1930s, the German Panzer I. And while like the Polish TK, uh, the Panzer I was by no means an impressive fighting machine, Unlike the Polish TK, it was to play a very important role in the formation of one of the most effective armored forces of the first half of World War II, the German Panzer Division. Now, we hope you have enjoyed this video. If so, please subscribe. If you would like to support the series, uh, be sure to visit our Patreon page. Um, we are hoping to release these videos uh, at a regular basis, uh, weekly if possible, probably no, no later than uh, every other week. Um, Honestly, our ability to make these videos will probably depend a little bit on what kind of support we get through Patreon. So again, if you want to help us out, uh, visit us there and uh, make a little donation. We would appreciate it, and we hope to see you on the next one.